be okay. I mean, that's the least of his worries, frankly, compared to all the other things he's going through. But the concept that it's okay and he's getting good health care merely re-emphasizes the fact that the Americans need an NHS. But then they go on to say the conditions are wonderful in uh, Guantanamo Bay too. And Shaka has now been in solitary isolation for, I think, probably longer than any other prisoner in Guantanamo. And he's now in Camp 5, uh, Echo Block, which is their punishment area, where they're in solitary confinement in a place that looks a bit like your toilet, probably. Except their toilet's not really there, they just have a hole in the ground. And he's been held there for months and months and months. And you know, they talk about how civilized and wonderful our whole system is. I've been to most death rows in America. I've spent many, many years working on death row. And I can tell you without fear of contradiction that the conditions in Guantanamo Bay are worse than any death row I've ever been to. And this is for someone who's committed no crime, who's never going to be convicted of committing a crime, who's been cleared for release for four years, and they have the goal to say the conditions are okay. They're not. They're horrible. And so we remember Shaka, and we remember our obligation to him. We also remember many of the other prisoners, and I think it's very important to have their stories out there. And that's our obligation in terms of, you know, Ahmed el Bacha, who lived down in Bournemouth for a while. And actually, John Prescott gave him a tip one time, because he was working in a hotel, and old two Jags thought he'd done quite a good job cleaning up the room at the Labour Party conference, and so gave him a tip. Uh, and we did approach Prescott to see if he would act as an ex-friend for uh, Ahmed and get him back to Britain, but he never replied. But, you know, the, we've got to remember all of these people who are left in Guantanamo Bay who we need to get out of them. We also need to understand a bit about why folk aren't being released. With Shaka, it was originally that the U.S. wanted to send him to Saudi Arabia, and they wanted to do that because we have the First Amendment, in America, we believe in free speech as long as it's not one of these people. Um, and so what we wanted to do was make damn sure that we didn't send Shaka back to Britain where he would give irritating interviews in the media about what's really going on in Guantanamo Bay. And we wanted to send him to Saudi Arabia so they could gag him. Uh, now, that's not happened, thankfully. But now the reason that he's not being released is because of the idiotic laws that David Rifkin was just defending on the radio. He actually quoted the NDAA, uh, and you know what that says is just un unfathomable. We've now passed a law that identifies 171 people and says that those people have to be held until the Secretary of Defense personally, Leon Panetta personally, signs something saying, I promise that Shakarama won't commit a crime in the future. And what's more, I promise, well, I promise that Britain's not a failing state facing revolution imminently, which probably sadly is not. Uh, but he also has to promise that, um, that the British intelligence services will share with the Americans everything that they know about Shaka's associates. Well, I'm proud to say that I'm one of Shaka's associates, and so I take it that means the Brits have to share what well, I attached to the Dallas on, uh, on my email which my wife and I do periodically send uh, polite messages to the intelligence services apologizing for being so boring. But, uh, you know, these are the rules that prevent the United States right now, in theory, from releasing folk. But as Michael said, it's, it's only in theory. In practice, if they had the moral courage to do it, they could do it. And they're only going to get that moral courage if we do our job.